For those of you who have just stumbled across this video, welcome. I'm thankful that you guys are watching it, us. It is just a blessing that this time brings, that people from all across the world can come and hear the truths of God's Word. I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to watch the previous messages on Esther to better help you understand the book and its purpose. You can check out our YouTube page for those videos. Hey, Lighthouse Youth. I look forward to seeing you all soon. But for now, it is still so good that we are able to worship together as a body of Christ. For our call to worship, I'll be reading from Psalm 103, 15 through 22. This is the word of the Lord. It says, As for a man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the, from, of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul. Here, David is praising God who was faithful even in the middle of difficult times. So during our difficult season, I pray that we as a church can still worship and give praise to a God who is greater than this virus, greater than life itself, greater than anything we could ever imagine or achieve. We can have hope in something that is greater than this world with its corruption and brokenness. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed time that you've given us just to come together as a church family and be able to worship you. I pray that you would just, during this time, let us be able to focus on you and see how you are able to work through this darkness and use this for your greater good. And I pray that you would just let our worship be reflection of our commitment to you, Lord, and a commitment to knowing that you are all-powerful and shame.
Uh, good evening to everyone watching. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys have not started bouncing off the, the walls of your house. I'm pretty sure if you're like me, you're probably bouncing off of something. But anyway, I'm glad that you guys are here. I, I do miss seeing your faces every Friday night and the conversations that I've been able to have with most of you. I, I hope, like me, you've been encouraged by this past Easter weekend and the messages that have um, helped us to just remember who God is and, and what he's doing. Um, not just what he did on the cross, but what's to come for eternity when we spend it with him. Today in Esther, we'll be looking at the end of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3, and you guys can start turning there now. A quick recap of Esther this far. It is about 480 BC in the land of Susa where the dispersion of Jews outside of their home country are now living. So far in our story, we have come, we have been introduced to, how do I put this nicely, uh, a stupid and, and clueless king named Ahasuerus who, who loves to drink and pretty much listens to everything everyone says. We, we've been, we have also been introduced to Esther, a, a Jewish nobody who somehow manages to become the queen. And Mordecai, her, her father, who, well, we're not really sure about his motives. And sometimes I, I can look at a story like this and think, man, I thought, I thought cartoons like Spongebob were, were weird and random, but I guess Esther was the original cartoon? Well... Our story of Esther is, is not a cartoon, and it's not random. Pastor Eric in his messages earlier, in his earlier messages said that throughout all that is happening, God is everywhere in this book. And though his name is never mentioned, and throughout everything that's going on, we will not see randomness, but rather a divinely orchestrated story made to, to draw the readers to look to him and to look for him. And I hope that you can as well. Actually, I want you guys to do something a little different. Every odd and strange thing you see as we go through our passage tonight, I, I want you guys to pay special attention to it, to, to circle it or to highlight it or to write it on a piece of paper. It will not have significance now, but by the end of our time in Esther, I do believe that these things will be clear for you as the story unfolds. So with that, let me read to our, through our passage today, and then we will pray. So look with me at Esther chapter 2, and we're going to be starting in verse 19. It says, Now when the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Tirish, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found, out, and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Chapter 3. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told him in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews 
the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver in, into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it in the king's treasuries. So the king took off his signet ring from his hand and gave it to him in the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you. The people also do with them as, you, as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors all over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Let's pray. Father God, so many times during life, we can wonder, God, where are you? What are you doing? Lord, as much as we can believe that that you are here, Lord, it's hard to see it at times. And, And so, Father God, I pray that even as we unpack your word tonight, we ask that you would be glorified, that you would show yourself to not only just be God, but that you are good. And that, Lord, you are in the workings of every single detail. So, Father God, be with us tonight as we unpack your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where is God? That's a question that we've been asking from the beginning of our time in Esther. But tonight, I want to ask you another question. What is he doing? One of my favorite fishing stories is from my cousin back home named Junior. He is the total opposite of me. He's a jack of all trades. He is full of common sense and he is a master of the ocean. At 19, he was able to accomplish something that, frankly speaking, I will never be able to accomplish in my life. That is, he caught a 300 pound blue marlin. The picture should be somewhere beside my face, somewhere. For for, For size comparison, here is my other cousin holding its head. And then lastly, here it is on the table. And so as expecting, the question I had to ask him was, what cheat code did you use to make it happen? No, I didn't ask him that. I asked him, how did you catch this thing? And so he told me, I was on the boat, I was trolling the the fishing lines when I heard the fish hook. And it didn't take long for me to realize that it was a monster of a fish. And so as I started reeling it in and it got close to the boat, I decided to release it. And I was like, at this point in the story, I was like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean you you released it? Like, aren't you supposed to do the opposite? Well, going on in his story, I happened to find out that 
when he started to fully unpack it, the story did not, the method did not seem as crazy as I initially thought. This method of repeatedly reeling in the fish and releasing it multiple times exhausted the fish until it was no longer able to fight. And so after doing this for about two hours, the fish was so exhausted that Junior was finally able to bring it into the boat. I share this with you because one, it's a really cool story, but also two, if I had cut Junior off before the end of the story, if I had caught him right where he said he released it, then I would have never understood the method to his madness. Maybe for some of you guys in this season, or in a season to come, you're going to ask the question, God, what on earth are you doing? I don't see how any of this makes sense, and I don't see how any of this is of any good. And I want you guys to see that the God of the Bible is in fact a God whose plans, though they are never fully understood, they are always perfect and good. And that brings me to my key idea, that in all circumstances, we know that God's plan is always good and his timing is always perfect. In our passage today, I want us to look at two plots. And the first one is this. So where's the reward? So from the last time we left off in Esther, when Esther became queen, roughly some years have gone by. And during this time, for whatever reason, most likely the king's twisted self-pleasure, he wants the virgins to be gathered a second time. But he already has a wife. Well, anyway, what we see also in this passage in verse, 19, in verse 19 specifically, we see that Mordecai is, is doing something. He's, he's sitting at the king's gate. Earlier in chapter 2, if you guys look at verse 11, it says that and every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem. And now he's no longer at the court, but now he's at the king's gate. Is he some kind of hobo just circling around? What is he doing? Well, comes to find out that during this period of time, he has actually been promoted. So to be in the king's gate was actually an administrative position, that of a royal service. And by the way, as much as you think this is mindless information, please keep it in mind because it is not. So he's not just a bystander begging for bread, but he is an agent in the king's palace. This would provide him the connections in order to uncover the plot that's about to take place. Let's keep reading. Verse 20, Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. So Esther was raised by Mordecai. We, we found out about that in our last message. And this obedience that we see from Esther is going to play a big role in the next chapter, not just towards Mordecai, but towards the Lord. But for now, for now, I want you guys to see something. We're not given the reason why Mordecai told her to hide her identity as a Jew. Hiding her identity could have made a huge difference between her becoming queen and not. It could have also just being for the purpose of people-pleasing. And I ask this question, can God use us when we, even when we screw up? The, the rest of Esther leads us to say, well, yes. But so often we can make this excuse to continue to compromise. In Romans 6, Paul asks the question, do we continue in sin so that grace might abound? He, he answers his own question. He says, by no means. It can be so easy to rationalize our sin. Maybe like what Esther is doing right here. And oftentimes we can say, I know God can use my screw up for later. He may indeed choose to do so, but it is by no means an excuse to keep on doing wrong. God does not take lightly our sin. 
That's why Jesus had to die on the cross for it. And neither should we take sin lightly. Back to our passage, though. We, we are now introduced to two people um, in the story. Their name, one of the, their names are Bigthan and Tirish. These guys made a plot to kill King Ahasuerus. It is not entirely clear why they were angry. It might have been because of Mordecai's promotion. But regardless of their reasoning, the two men that were meant to guard the king, that's what eunuchs did, they're now trying to kill the king. Mordecai somehow hears about this plot and, well, what luck, his daughter is the queen. So he is now able to quickly communicate it to her. But catch this. When Esther told the king about the plot, she did so in the name of Mordecai. Okay, let's see what happens in the next verse, verse 23. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the, pro, of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So the guards were given what they deserved, hung at the gallows. And Mordecai's name is mentioned in basically what you can call the king's diary. But, well, it ends right there. There's, Mordecai does not get a reward for just saving the king's life. He doesn't get promoted again. He doesn't get a grand sum of money. He doesn't even get a pat on the back. He gets forgotten. That's his reward. Here we have, folks, the perfect example of an absent-minded king. And life can, can very well be unfair like this at times. We all, at one point or another, have probably felt like Mordecai, mistreated, neglected. And it can oftentimes lead us to wonder, what is God doing? But the situation, unfortunately, in our story doesn't get any better. It gets worse. Let us go on to the second plot. So is this the end? Again, some time passes as we enter into chapter 3. And in chapter 3, verse 1, we see, we see something. It says, After these things, King Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus promotes Haman? Wait, 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 wait. hold on. King, weren't, what about Mordecai? Like, he, he saved your life. Are you just going to leave him hanging? Who, who's Haman? Well, now we're introduced to a new character in our story. And he is not a nice one. His name is Haman, and he has an introduction. He is called an Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Have you guys ever played Zelda? If you've ever reached the end of any Zelda game, it's, it shouldn't be a spoiler. You're going to fight a guy named Ganon or Ganondorf. But he is never just called by this name. For example, in an ancient old game that probably none of you guys have played called Ocarina of Time, he is called Great King of Evil, Ganondorf. What we are seeing here in our passage is somewhat, somewhat of, a, of an equivalent of that. And I'll explain why. Well, the first thing, what's, what's an Agagite? Well, there was a king some 600 years ago, prior to this time, named Agag. And this king was the enemy of the Jews. Saul, being Israel's first king, at the time, in 1 Samuel 15, failed to obey the command of the Lord and sping, spared King Agag. I'm going to turn over there really quickly. And this is what it says in verse 2. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have, do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep. You get the point. Now, let's, let's jump to verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. 
But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fighting cows. Do you see what happened? Let's go back there. Haman is now a descendant of these people. These people that were the enemies of the Jews. And, and to make matters worse, um, he's not just an Agagite. He is the son of Hamadatha. He is a direct bloodline. He is indirect bloodline of the king. That's trouble. But let's talk about his name for a second. Haman. It doesn't mean much to us, but it rings a bell to the Jews. And not a good one. He is... Um, sorry. His name means confusion, uproar, disturbance. It is not a pleasant name. And for some reason, it may, if it, whatever reason it may be, the enemy of the Jews is now the one who gets promoted. And not to an administrator position like Haman, um, like Mordecai at the king's gate. No, he is now second in command in all of the kingdom. Verse 2, it says, And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. So a command is made towards people under Haman's authority, and they are told to bow down. And this act of bowing down was an implied idea of worship. And Mordecai had a problem with that. We see it later in the verse, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. It is not entirely clear why Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. It wasn't inherently sinful if he did. It could have been because he wanted to honor the Lord, showing that the Lord is the only one who is worthy of worship. Or it could have been an act of rebellion against an Agagite. It could have also been a sense of pride and frustration. This guy gets a position over me that I deserve? Well, it could have been all of these things. Well, for whatever reason, uh, Mordecai does not bow, and Haman does not like it. When we go to verse 5, it says, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was Filled with fury. This isn't the little frustration that you have with your siblings or your parents when you, you don't get what you want. Right? No, Haman is so consumed by his hatred that it takes control of him. So what does he do? Well, he goes on to make a plot. And this plot is not just against Mordecai. No, he's not content with that. He wants to destroy all the Jews. Haman's intent is now made known. He is a wicked man with w wicked schemes. He is the villain. It seems that like, the fruit doesn't really fall too far from the tree. And so when the Agaites wanted to kill and destroy the Jews, now is the chance that they have through, through Haman. And so now it is Haman's mission to complete what was failed in the past. So with vengeance and a hatred, hatred in his heart, he begins his plot. And how does he go about it? Well, he goes about it by casting lots. Or a modern day equivalent, he rolls dice. So in the first month of the year, he decides to cast lots. And day after day, he does so until one day, it lands on a specific time. And he so chooses to use as a day of destruction for the Jews, the 12th month, the month of Adar. This is an important month to keep in mind. So he ends up choosing almost an entire year to enact his extermination of the Jews. Hmm. Usually you would think a man in his position and with the hatred that he has for the Jews, he would have chosen the next day, but he doesn't. Why this random time? Well, it's not just random in Haman's eyes. 
in, in those days, casting lots had some form of divine emphasis. As to say that this timing was the timing of God or the gods. So Haman saw this time as perfect. But, but somebody else did too. But let's keep going. So Haman now tattletales on the Jews. He says in verse 8, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Okay, well, that's true. Let's keep going. Their laws are different from those of every other people. Uh, okay, that's a bit of a stretch. I mean, yeah, these are God's people, but they're still living in the same land as them. And they do not keep the king's laws, so it, does not, it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Whoa, do you see what he did there? He goes from a truth to a half-truth to a flat-out lie. One little piece of disobedience from one man, Haman calls a national rebellion against the king. But with this compelling lie and a ridiculously large sum of money, he gets the king's approval. But not just his approval. Haman now gets what's called the signet ring, the king's signet ring. And this ring is not an ordinary ring. With this ring, Haman now has the power to seal any word, any order, as if it was from the king himself saying it. And once a contract is made and it is sealed with the king's signet ring, there is no turning back. Unknowingly, due to his absent-mindedness, the king has given a complete okay to kill a man that has saved his life, his entire people, as well as the queen. Well, hurriedly, the edict is made, and it is mass-produced in every language to all the inhabitants of the land of Susa. And it is sealed with the king's signet ring. Verse 13, it says, Letters were sent by courier to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, month which is the month of Adar. What's significant about this 13th day? It is the day before the Passover feast. A feast remembering the day that God delivered the people from the Pharaoh's hands. What was supposed to be a, grand, a, a, a great day of a grand celebration for all the Jews now is going to be a great time of mourning as they await the day of their destruction. And so we end off there in chapter 3 with the city literally in a, a, in a state of Haman. Of, of confusion, uproar, and disturbance, while Haman and the king sit down and drink. This is a, a dreary thought to think about, but imagine with me you woke up tomorrow at, at 1 p.m. Don't tell me you guys aren't doing this. I know you are. But imagine with me you wake up tomorrow at 1 p.m. and you, you go into the living room and you see your parents crying. You, you look at the news President Trump is on, and the look on his face brings you at unease. He proceeds to say that, as found by national authorities, Christians have been, quote-unquote, completely disregarding the quarantine procedures nationwide, meeting for gatherings against government orders. Trump makes a declaration that all Christians are to be executed by April the 3rd, 2021 as a way to keep everyone in America from being affected by COVID-19. You know for a fact that Christians have not been disregarding the protocol to stay at home, but somehow this false news makes it, makes it to the president's ear, and he is not retracting this decision. April 3rd of, of next year, 2021, is the Saturday before Resurrection Sunday. You begin to cry. What's going on in your heart at this moment? What's going through your mind? What are you feeling? What questions are you asking God? God, what are you doing? Do you feel the weight of this story? 
This is very much a situation we find the Jews in. And I'm pretty sure that this was one of the questions the Jews were asking at this point, if they even had the emotional strength to do so. And many times in life, we too can ask the question, God, what on earth are you doing? Without any warning, the city of Susa is thrown into a world of confusion. Their life took a drastic turn for the worst. Through life's un unforeseen circumstances, we too can be thrown into a world of confusion. When will this be over? Will my family member be another number? Will I be another number? God, is this some kind of sick joke? So many questions run through your head as you try to grasp a whole life and it falls through your fingers like sand. Maybe you are asking these questions now. Maybe you have asked them in the past. At some point in our lives, we will question what God is doing. Because whether or not we want to be honest with ourselves, we question whether or not what God is doing makes any sense at all. It is like he's reeling in the fish just to release it and leave us with no further explanation. This is where we find ourselves in Esther. This is what Esther is all about. It is showing us the active working of a loving and covenant-keeping God while never really showing us where he is or telling us what he's doing. The, set, the setting that we find ourselves here in chapter 3 is a very dark one and seemingly a very hopeless one. The edict is sealed. There is no way it will be retracted. The word of the Jews' destruction is proclaimed throughout the entire nation. There is no way of escape. Their world is turned upside down. And I dare say we will never fully be able to grasp the, the sheer chaos that they are going through. I'm pretty sure for the Israelites, they wanted the 11 months to be over now. They wanted to wake up from this nightmare. For some of you guys, to some extent, you might be right here in this nightmare. Your world might be upside down right now. Whether that's the, the loss of having your one high school graduation that you've always wanted to have, or rather your, the virus has physically entered into your home. Maybe it is depression settling in or, or the, the horrible feelings of loneliness. These are real feelings and real struggles that I can imagine that you guys are struggling with. And I do not want to belittle them. Or, or maybe you're not there yet, but a season will come when trials will hit hard. And you will question the God of the Bible. Whether it is now or for a time to come, here are some ways that you can be equipped to endure this season of chapter 3. Feed on the truths of Christ and not on the lies of the enemy. It is easy to believe in times of difficulty that God does not care. He's, he's absent. And he, it may be that his plans are evil. But these are the same kind of lies that the enemy, the devil, used in, chap in Genesis chapter 3. Like Haman, Satan twists truths. And he leads us to think about God in a way that we make him to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says to the church, But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Do you get it? The enemy wants us to believe a lie. And, those, and through those lies, he wants to lead us astray and to destroy us. But this is what God's word says is true. Psalm 18, verse 30. This God, the God of the Bible, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. It is so easy in times of difficulty to be lost in the chaos and the confusion. But if we have placed our faith in what Christ has done for us, then we rest assured that his, that his promises are that nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ our Lord. We can rest assured that through, though this world is fallen and chaos seems to reign, that this is not the end. We have a sure and steady hope in eternity. What can sickness do to us? What can persecution do to us? What can death do to us? As 1 Corinthians 15 and 55 says, O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? What then, as believers, what we then, as believers, we feed ourselves with the truths of God. And in those truths, we are transformed into his image. Loved one, if you are not in Christ, the story, it does not end well for you. A life outside of Jesus is a life outside of hope. And I plead with you, trust in what God has done for you. Get to know the Jesus that came to die for you. Trust in what God did for you through his son. Turn from your life of sin and be transformed by the good news of the gospel. I don't know about you guys, but this season was definitely not what I expected. No one could expect that 2020 would just give up and then quarantine. Could you have expected your 2020 to turn out like this? But rather than just giving up on this year altogether, our hope is that you would not merely survive, but that you would thrive in this season. See, if I'm not careful, I can find myself oftentimes oftentimes using the time that God has given me on this earth and even in this season to feed, uh, instead of feeding my knowledge of him and getting to know him more, I can feed myself on knowledge of something else. I can oftentimes find myself daydreaming about what life can be like during this time or, or if this wasn't happening or in the time to come instead of actually being present and allowing the Lord to, to grow me in this season. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are just trying to get by the season. Chapter three of your life seems too gloomy and you just want to, to skip right over it. Let me share with you, God will use you or use this season to grow you into his image and to love him more. If that season is now for you, how are you making the most of it? The Jews as we will find out soon enough, they did not just spend 11 months in chaos. No, they trusted the Lord and acted in faith. How are you growing your faith in this season? Are you using the extra time that God has given you to feed on his word? To, to know the Christ that you're supposed to trust in? To find unique ways to fellowship with other believers? On a side note, I think one of the most precious, thing, precious things that I've found this season has brought for me and my friends is that we now have the time to, to Bible study almost every day on Zoom. Now that our busy schedules have come to a halt, we now have the privilege to get to, to feed on God's Word together with other brothers and sisters almost every night. What about you? What valuable things does this season bring for you? Do not waste this season, because God is not wasting it. As I close our time together, if you remember from our story, I mentioned that Haman saw the day of destruction for the Jews as perfect. But I also mentioned that someone else did too. And if you guys haven't figured it out by now, I was referring to God. God isn't going to use this time to destroy the Jews. 
He's going to use it for something far better. This is not where the story ends. Though hardship and difficulty will come, a time of redemption and salvation will come as well. And this will be the same for all who bear the name of Christ. We do not have to be stuck in chapter 3. For we know that God's story is good and that it is perfect. The things you might have circled or highlighted would seem strange now. But there will come a time when it will all come together and you will see the greater and better story that God has in store. My hope for you is that all, my hope for you all is that you will always see God's bigger story in mind, his bigger picture amidst all your circumstances. He is not absent-minded like King Ahasuerus. No, he is fully thoughtful in all his ways and in all his actions. God is doing something in this COVID-19 season. He is saving lives. He is saving his lost sheep. He is growing his church into a deeper desire to know him. And he is pointing believers to the reality of the hope to come. God allowed for COVID-19, COVID-19 for a reason. And as hard as it may be to look at it like that, it is good and this timing is perfect. So instead of seeing God in light of your plans, loved one, will you look at your plans in light of God? Will you love, will love loved one, will you take your life and put it into his story, into his plan? You will see that life is not as hopeless as it looks. Even in the midst of chaos, there is comfort. The, the God of the universe is near to us. And though we, will ne- we na- may never feel it, this remains true. God is making a beautiful thing out of this. I don't know what it is. And I'm pretty sure you don't either. But I know for myself, as I look back at the cross, the horrible and evil thing that was made for destruction, I see how he beautifully used it to make life. Trust in what the Lord is doing. For his will, his plan is perfect and it is good. Will you pray with me? Father God, help us. Lord, when chapter 3 seems so gloomy and we just want to get stuck in it and we don't want to leave, I ask, Lord, that you would help us to see the bigger story in mind. Help us to see your great salvation and help us to cling and to hold on to the hope that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. So God, thank you. Thank you for the work you are doing, seen and unseen. Lord, help us to see it. Help us to trust you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. So now that we're finished, you guys are going to have a little break. So go ahead, do whatever you need to do. Grab your chips, use the restroom, and we will see you at 845.